What a great grace to be surrounded by His love. Amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated. Ushers come with an outline for anyone who missed one on the way in. If you need an outline, <clears throat> raise your hand and they will get to you straight away. And of course, now's a good time for me to welcome uh, everybody worshiping in the prayer chapel today for the first time at 1030 and of course in the multi-purpose room uh, this morning as well. Thank you for going to uh, these places and uh, thank God for modern technology that uh, at least in some sense allows us to be in uh, three places at one time. And so, but we're, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're worshiping with us and thank you everyone for stretching and doing everything possible to help us take as many people uh, to heaven with us as possible. Keep praying about our new balcony, which we are hoping and believing God for uh, this year. Let me also, uh, again, just echo the announcement that was made by Pastor Brigham. Come tonight, be a part of this business meeting. You say, well, Pastor Tim, a business meeting sounds like about the most boring thing in the world. I promise you ours is not boring. Uh, in fact, we give a money-back guarantee. So you come tonight, and if you find it boring, uh, Pastor Brigham will reimburse you, all right? <laughs> Starting point at 5 o'clock in room 226 upstairs. This is the class that I teach. It's four lessons, four weeks. It is a prerequisite for getting involved or doing anything here. So you got to go through that class. you got to spend four classes with me. And so I hope you'll come and get started in that with me today. 5 o'clock, room 226 upstairs and all the way down uh, the hall. Uh, listen, I know things are tight, but keep reaching out to people. Amen? Uh, we we want to take as many people to heaven with us as we can. I was at the pharmacist yesterday picking up a prescription, and the lady behind the counter says, Wow, you're a lot bigger in person. <laughs> I said, uh, Do I know you? And uh, she said, Mr. Honnell, who was in the 830 service today, Mr. Honnell has told me about your church and has invited me out to your church. I haven't been there yet but I'm watching online. And so uh, thank God uh, for this commitment to evangelism. So keep reaching out, keep inviting people. And if they won't come at your first invite, direct them to our website and that way they can kind of uh, check us out from a safe distance uh, before they make the journey to this wonderful, wonderful place. Well, we began a new sermon series last week in the book of Mark. And Mark introduced us to the gospel of the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark introduced us to a somewhat odd or a different uh, character known as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer who baptized by immersion those who came to him with repentant hearts, that repentance being evidenced by the confession of their sins. And then I took time before closing out the message last Sunday to introduce us to John Mark, uh, the author of this book, who wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but who also was just an ordinary guy, so ordinary that he failed God more than once, but was humble enough to keep coming back to God who gave him a second and even a third chance. How many are thankful to God for second and third chance? chances today. What a wonderful time we had around these altars last Sunday as more than a dozen people said to God, God, I need a second chance too. And so they came confessing their sins and humbly acknowledging their need of a second chance as they put their faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, as seven or eight people already did, at least in the sanctuary, in the first service this morning. In fact, it was such a wonderful move of God's Spirit that one of our seminarian uh, interns uh, said to me, Pastor, this was last Sunday night, he was talking to me about the Sunday morning services. He said, Pastor, God was really moving at the conclusion of our services today. I said, yeah, I know it was a good day. And He said, no, no, no. He said, I mean, God was really moving. I said, yes, uh, yes, he was. And then the seminarian proceeded to say, but, but the sermon wasn't that great. Thank God for our seminarians. What a joy it is to mentor them. <laughs> but of course, he was precisely correct. He was precisely correct. And it was an important lesson for any young minister in training, for none of any of our sermons is ever good enough. 
It's never that good. Instead, it was a reminder of the truth given to us by God in Zechariah 4, 6, that it is not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty, that his work is done. Praise God for the power and the working of his spirit among us. Amen? Amen. By the way, pray for that seminarian. He's not been seen since last week. Someone thought he was, there was a report of him in northern Maine, almost up to the Canadian border, but uh, anyway. So we come to Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11 today. Somebody asked, Pastor, how long is it going to take us to get through Mark? I have no idea. But we're just going to plug along. We're not going to be in a hurry. We're going to take our time. Some Sundays we may cover 20 verses. Some Sundays, like today, we're only going to cover three. And today we're covering verses 9 to 11, which is the account of Jesus' baptism. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants to show us or remind us again today about the importance of the baptism of Jesus as well as the importance of our own water baptism. So look at the text with me, Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. Here's what we read. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. Remember, Jesus grew up in Nazareth and was baptized by John in the Jordan. I had the privilege of baptizing some of you in the Jordan River back in 2009. What a special time that was together. What a, what a meaningful moment there in the Jordan River. And of course, uh, we have that memory to share for the rest of our lives. Verse 10, as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. Torn open. Think of the cosmic forces that are being impacted at this moment as Jesus Christ prepares to begin his public ministry, is about to receive his coronation from Father God. He's baptized, and as he's coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. Only one other place is that word used in the New Testament, and it's in reference to the temple, the curtain in the, uh, in the temple, being torn in two from top to bottom as Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross of Calvary, having opened up a way for us to have direct access to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. Thank God that the heavens have been torn open for us today through the finished work of Jesus Christ our Lord. So he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And I will not have time to say much about the Holy Spirit in the message today. But please understand that everything Jesus did in his ministry and everything and anything you and I will ever do can only be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. Now the Holy Spirit is not a dove. Right. Holy Spirit is not a bird. Okay? But he descended like a dove, which is sort of a striking contrast. His gentleness, his gentle descent is sort of a striking contrast to the heavens actually being torn open. Verse 11, and a voice came from heaven. Hallelujah. And a voice came from heaven. Three things. Here's a good three-point sermon for somebody to preach because I'm not going to preach it today. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Speaking today on the subject of baptism of Jesus and ours as well. Father, thank you for these moments around your word. God, what a privilege it is to gather together to worship and to study your word each Sunday. Open our spiritual ears to hear, our spiritual eyes to see. Open up our hearts to receive and then grant us the faith so that with hands and feet of obedience, we will carry out that which you speak to us this day. Hide your servant behind the cross. Oh, Jesus, may I decrease and you increase for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said amen, amen. and amen. So we've come to the account of Jesus' water baptism in our Bible study today, which means the Holy Spirit wants us to think about the importance of our Lord's baptism and to also think about how His baptism intersects with the importance of each of us being baptized in water as well. And I want to give you one word that will hopefully 
simplify how we look at water baptism and why it is so important. One word, I hope you'll write it down, that word is identify. Identify. You see, Jesus was baptized in water to identify with someone, and we are baptized in water to identify with someone. So water baptism is all about identifying with someone else. And I'm going to give you the answer to the quiz right up front this morning, class, and tell you that Jesus left heaven to come to earth to identify with us so that we on earth could identify with him and go to heaven. I'm going to say that again because I don't want anybody to fail this quiz because it's not, there's a whole lot more than just a quiz on the line here. Eternity's on the line here. Jesus left heaven to come to earth to identify with us so that we on earth could identify with him and go to heaven. How many are here, you've had the experience of always wanting to go somewhere or to get into some place, but you could not gain entrance on your own? But because you eventually had someone to go with you, uh, because you were with them, you were able to get in. Ever had that happen? Or is there anyone here that got yourself in trouble somewhere along the line and if left on your own, you would have been in big trouble, but then someone came along and bailed you out of that situation. Anybody ever have that happen? Three of you, okay. <laughs> I know what to preach on next Sunday. <laughs> I'll never forget the story. I've shared it before, particularly on Father's Day. It uh, tends to be a Father's Day uh, story, and I know my dad is in the prayer chapel listening today. He didn't want to go to the prayer chapel unless he was assured his son was still going to be on the screen. So I'm on the screen today, Dad. <laughs> Though I'm told I'm a little smaller on that screen than I am in here, which is a good thing. But I was about 10 years of age, and my father had given me a little air rifle, and, and uh, so it didn't really shoot anything. It was just an air rifle. And I was out in the front lawn one day just shooting at cars as they would go by. And, and, uh, but uh, when I went to, to uh, crank up the gun... Um, I would put the, I put the barrel of it into the ground. And as you can imagine, evidently some dirt or something got in the gun. And so uh, I'm just, you know, uh, playing Daniel Boone or something there, shooting at cars as they go by. And evidently, evidently, I still am not sure this really happened, but the driver in the car said something hit his car. And he pulled over off to the side of the road very quickly. Turns out he was a local judge. And... Because he had had some threats on his life, he was always escorted home by a police officer who also now pulled off to the side of the road. <laughs> and the judge got out of the car screaming bloody murder at me. He wanted me arrested. I think he wanted, he was ready to execute me right there. <laughs> and uh, he wanted the police officer to take me and put me in, in, in uh, youth detention or something. And they, the guy was about ready to arrest me, a 10-year-old boy with an air rifle. And then another car pulled off to the side of the road, and it was my father. Boy, was I ever happy to see my father. <laughs> and my father got out of the car, and he knew the judge because he worked in social services, and he said to the judge, this is my son. And thus the reason for this being a story I tell in my Father's Day messages. But when my father said, this is my son, I immediately said to the judge, yes, I'm with him. I'm with him. I'm with him. <laughs> Well, here's the point. Water baptism is all about us saying, I'm with him. I'm with him. I'm with Jesus. I'm with the perfect one who came to earth to die for me. A very, very imperfect person. An imperfect person who could never be good enough to deserve any of God's grace or any of God's love or any of God's mercy. But through the waters of baptism, I have identified with Christ. I have come to understand that he died on the cross of Calvary for my sins. So I have repented of my sins. I have confessed my sins. And I have chosen to identify with Christ. I have chosen to tell the world that I am with him. Amen. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. So that explains why we get baptized in water, but here's the more curious question, and it's the first question and the first point of the sermon this morning. Why did Jesus have to get baptized in water? Why did Jesus 
have to be baptized. You ever think about that, wonder about that? After all, as we pointed out last week, John the Baptist was baptizing people who were coming to confess and repent of their sins. They needed to be baptized. They needed to acknowledge their sinfulness, but not Jesus. This is the perfect Son of God. This is God manifested in the flesh. And in Matthew's account of Jesus coming to be baptized, we see that John the Baptist is also confused and hesitant to baptize him. Look at Matthew 3.13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to detour him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, Jesus, and do you come to me? So even John the Baptist was confused about why Jesus would come to him to be baptized, even as John the Baptist acknowledged that he is the one who should be baptized by Jesus. You see, John the Baptist knew about Jesus. Why? Because they were relatives. Remember, John's mother was named Elizabeth. Jesus' mother, of course, was Mary. And they were related, probably cousins. And, of course, both of them had miraculous conceptions. Elizabeth, because she was old and barren. Mary, because she was a virgin. And they gave birth to these two boys about six months apart, John the Baptist being the older one. And so it's very likely that they got together for family and religious events. The, not, nothing of that sort is recorded for us in Scripture. But can't you just imagine these two Jewish mothers talking about their boys? Mary says to Elizabeth, hey, how's your boy? Elizabeth would say, well, he's a little odd, to tell you the truth. You know, he's lived most of his life apart from us out in the desert. How's your boy? And I can just see Mary... She would have bowed her head probably and just said softly, perfect. <laughs> perfect. I mean, who can resist that, right? This was long before our days with the bumper sticker mentality with all kinds of depraved children being celebrated on bumper stickers by their parents as if they were perfect. Thought you'd laugh at that a little bit more, but anyway. So John knew about Jesus, though we have no record of their paths crossing until this moment of Jesus' baptism. In fact, this is the only time they appear together in the Scriptures. And Jesus is asking John to baptize him. John is resisting. And then Jesus says this in Matthew 3, 15. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this. Now watch this phrase. To fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. What does this phrase, to fulfill all righteousness, mean? Well, a couple of thoughts. First, righteousness has to do with doing everything that is righteous. Or put another way, to do absolutely everything that God requires. Jesus says, if this is what God commands, then I, as a man, must do what my heavenly Father commands. Even though I am holy and perfect, I will be obedient. And if Jesus is an example to us of anything, loved ones, he is an example to us of complete and comprehensive obedience to the will of God. And he teaches us that blessing follows obedience. Anointing follows obedience, for there is no substitute for obedience. So thank God that Jesus was completely obedient because we never could be. Which leads to a second thought about how Jesus fulfilled all righteousness by being baptized. And that is because of what his water baptism represented symbolically. Now, we know that water baptism is a symbolic act of something that has happened inside of us. Most of us understand the symbolic significance of us identifying with Christ when we are baptized. That is to say, identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. 
And so it is that when we come to be water baptized, having repented of our sins, we're giving testimony to the world that when I go down into those waters, that's a picture of me having died to my old life, being buried, and now as I come up out of the water, being resurrected to new life through the power of Jesus Christ. So we, we get that. We understand the symbolism of that. But many times we fail to understand that Jesus was baptized in water to symbolically identify with us. And not just to identify with us as people and humankind, but to identify with our sin. For only a sinful person would need to be baptized. And though Jesus had not sinned and never would sin, he came to be baptized in water because one day he would in fact become sin for us on the cross of Calvary. For the cross is where the symbolism of sin became the reality of sin for Jesus Christ. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it, God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, he loved us so much that he was willing to be identified with us and, and with our sin. And he demonstrated it first symbolically by baptism, but when that symbolism had turned into a reality that required him to go all the way to the cross and die for our sins, he still said to the Father, I'm with them, I'm with them, I identify with them. Amen. Thank God that Jesus identified with you today. Amen. Thankfully, our God does not subscribe to deism Deism is the belief reached by reason that there may, in fact, be a supreme being, a creator of the universe, but he's, he's not a God that gets personally involved with his creation, not a God who relates or interacts with humankind. He just created the universe and threw it out there in space to unwind all on its own. Thank God he did not leave us all on our own. Thank God that he loved this world so much that he gave his one and only son to die on the cross of Calvary to pay the price for our sins so that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever identifieth with him should not perish but could have everlasting life. Thank God that Jesus was willing to identify himself with our sin so that we could identify ourselves with his righteousness. Or as the songwriter put it, love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours, I am yours forever and forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So that's why Jesus had to be baptized. Which leads to our second and final question today. Why do we need to be baptized? Why do we need to be baptized? Notice that the question is, why do we need, not why do we have to be baptized? You see, Jesus had to be baptized in order to identify with us and to fulfill all righteousness. He had to be baptized. But you, you don't have to be baptized. If you think you're good enough on your own, don't get baptized. If you don't want to identify with Christ, don't get baptized. But for those who would genuinely want an answer to the question, I offer you two, though I could give you ten. But first, water baptism is for us an act of obedience. In giving the Great Commission and some final words of instruction before his departure, we read in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, that Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And after making disciples of all nations, what's the first word after that? Baptizing. Baptizing, Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit 
and teaching them to what? Would that include obeying the command to be baptized? Would that include the command to be baptized? Yes. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says make disciples and among the first steps of that process is baptizing them. The Apostle Peter reiterates the same thing in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 on the day of Pentecost. When people convicted by the sermon and move of the Spirit ask what they were to do, Peter replied, repent. See, repentance always comes first. Listen, if you have not repented of your sins, all you're doing by getting baptized is you're going into the water a dry sinner and coming out a wet sinner. Water baptism does not save you. You must first repent of your sins and surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, the water baptism means nothing. But having repented, Peter says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you. Turn to your neighbor and tell them the Bible says everyone. 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 Go ahead. <laughs> repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name or in the authority of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. One of the most important reasons to get water baptized is because Jesus has told you to do so. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So if you love Jesus, you will get baptized. And until you obey him in this area of your life, there will always be an issue of disobedience between you and him. And as much as you may try to compensate for disobedience in this area by doing a lot of great stuff in some other area, you will not impress Jesus. For we're taught way back in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 15, 22, that to obey is better than sacrifice. So if you're a believer today in Jesus Christ and you have not yet been baptized, please hear me, loved one. You have not kept the Lord's command. With obedience comes blessing. With disobedience, there comes a loss of blessing, a loss of what could be. A limitation to your possibilities until you step forward and do the right thing. Until you step forward and obey the Lord. Now people come up with all kinds of questions and concerns about water baptism that give them pause. And some of these questions are sincere. Some of them are just a delay tactic. But I understand that some people have a genuine fear of water and being submersed. So while we show sensitivity and sympathy on the one hand, can I tell you that on the other hand, this has been an opportunity more than once for us to help people bind a spirit of fear, which we know is not from the Lord, and to experience deliverance over that fear as they step forward in faith and obedience. One lady said, Pastor Tim, I want to get baptized, but do you have to put my head underwater? I said, well... Did you just get saved from your neck down, or is your head saved too? <laughs> Have you surrendered your head to Jesus Christ, or are you just giving God everything below the neck? <laughs> Come on. Another cause for hesitation on the part of some is the fear of embarrassment or concerns over what they'll look like once they're all wet. I mentioned this last week. Is it safe to say that if your concern is over how good you're going to look when you're wet, your concerns are probably in the wrong place? <laughs> I mean, we're just, we're just being honest here. And look, we give you a nice robe or gown, and I mean, we, we help you out. Some of you ladies, you know, you wear like a little thing over your head, a cap over your hair because you don't want to get your hair wet. That's fine. doesn't matter to us. But whatever you do have, you might want to keep it, make sure it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay on. I, I, uh, I do remember... My daddy baptizing a lady years ago. Dad, you'll remember this story. And uh, he did not know that the lady wore a wig. And uh, <laughs> she went down in the water with the wig. She came up without the wig. <laughs> and she was getting so blessed. And she was just praising God and enjoying the moment without realizing that her wig had come off. And there it was floating on the water in the baptistry. <laughs> And I'm watching my dad, you know, learning so much from my father about pastoral ministry. And like, what, you know, what's he going to do? And so as she's starting to leave the tank, he reaches over, grabs the wig, and just plops it on her head. (laughs) 
Now, I don't know if I helped or helped alleviate or helped increase your concern or fears about water baptism there. <laughs> Other people avoid water baptism because they have a fear of standing in front of people or having to say something in public. And while the Bible does not mandate that observers be present at baptism, historically, that has usually been the case. And in fact, it is quite desirable. I mean, that's part of the point. Listen, in the days of John the Baptist, people came to be baptized publicly, facing the ridicule and mockery of onlookers. And can I remind you that Jesus Christ identified with us publicly and died for us publicly. At least here, you not only get assistance in preparing your testimony, but you get baptized in front of fellow believers. If you can't stand up for Jesus here, how are you going to do it out in the world? So water baptism is one of life's greatest opportunities to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Let's take advantage of that opportunity. Finally, some of you were baptized as infants, and you question the need to do so now that you are older. Well, first of all, let me... Say, thank God that you had parents that cared enough about you uh, that they wanted to dedicate you and commit you to the Lord. But here's the deal. You had nothing to do with that decision. That decision was a statement about your parents' faith, not about yours. Water baptism, or a believer's baptism as we call it, and as we see it here in the Scriptures, is a statement about your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And it needs to be pointed out, of course, that we do not have a single scripture or example in the Bible of babies being baptized. That was a tradition established by man, and though well intended, perhaps, was not a biblical practice ordained by God. So let me encourage you today, friend, if you have surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ, asking Him to forgive you of your sins and to become the Lord of your life, then take the next step of obedience and be baptized in water. Get in touch with Pastor Gorin. His information is in your bulletin and on our website. He's the pastor who teaches the water baptism classes and helps prepare you for water baptism. You say, Pastor, when are the next two classes? The next two classes, and you need to take both of them, March 12th and March 19th. That's the next two Sundays, March 12th, March 19th, at 12.30 p.m. in room 214. Please talk to Pastor Gorin or email him this week and make plans to get baptized. And then there's a second reason we're baptized in water, why we need to be baptized in water. It is a personal acknowledgement that I'm a sinner and need a Savior and a public testimony that I choose to identify with Christ. I gave you two reasons for why Jesus had to be baptized. Obedience to the Father and to identify with mankind in his sinful condition. And so I give you two reasons for why we need to be baptized. Obedience to the Father and to identify with Jesus and his righteousness. Our water baptism is our public declaration to one and all that I'm with him. I'm with Jesus. He died for my sins so that by grace through faith, I can live for Him. And so water baptism is a symbolic act of a spiritual reality. But please understand, it does not stop with the water baptism experience. But the water baptism experience is supposed to be a symbolic picture, not only that we've died to the old self, but now we live to new life in Christ. It changes the way we live our lives. So Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? This was in response to those who thought, well, you know, you can get water baptized and then just live any way you want. Paul says, no, verse 2, by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Watch this. In order that, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a what kind of life? A new life. Not the old life. Not the old life enslaved to sin, indulging our carnal uh, pleasures. No, a new life empowered by the resurrection power 
of Jesus Christ. How about Colossians 2, 11 to 13? Paul writes, in him that is in Christ, you also were circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Having been, look at this, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God. Anybody here today got faith in the power of God? Yes. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the circum uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. God made you alive with Christ. And he forgave us all our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Water baptism is not only our identity with Christ and his death, but our acknowledgement of the power that he gives us to live a new life. Amen. Jesus identified with us in our sin symbolically at his water baptism, but ultimately identified with us spiritually and in reality at the cross. And so it is that our water baptism is to be more than just a symbolic act of identifying with Christ. It is to be lived out realistically as we too have our cross experience. As Jesus pointed out in Luke 9, 23, for here's what he said. If anyone would come after me, if anyone, don't have to, but if you will, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his what? Take up his cross daily. Take up his cross daily. Daily, not every Sunday, not every third day. Take up his cross daily and follow me. You do not follow Jesus. You do not identify with Jesus just at church on Sunday or just at your water baptism. You are to live in resurrection power, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, and identify with Jesus. You are to live every day telling the world, I'm with him, I'm with him, I'm with Jesus. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul put it like this in Galatians 2.20. You say, Pastor Tim, I don't know if I can do it. Well, of course you can't, but Jesus in you can if you'll let him in. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. See, you got to die. That's death to the old life. But Christ lives in me. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm with him. So let me close by reading the text again as we see the coronation of our king for whom we have very little record leading up to this point. 30 years, very little about Jesus. But here's his appointed time of coronation and it begins with his water baptism. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Oh, come Holy Spirit. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. I don't know about you, I'm with him. When the day comes that I leave this world and the question has to be addressed, about where I'm going after I leave this world. I have no worries and no concerns about that because I'm with him. I can't get into heaven based on my goodness or my righteousness. I will surely get into heaven based on his righteousness because I have identified with him. I'm with him. He'll get me in. But here's the catch. You can't do that after you die. You can't wait till you die. Oh, oh, Jesus, can I get some help? A little help here. No. He's been offering you a little help your whole life. 
And today's your day. If you've never, ever identified with him, if you've never said, Jesus, I'm with you, today's your day. And if you'll do that, then because he is God's son, we become a son or a daughter of God. And because God loves him, he loves you and me. And he's already shown that love to us. And every night you can pillow your head and know that God is pleased with you, not because you're perfect, but because he's perfect. And you're with him. You're with him. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me for a word of closing prayer? Jesus, 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 how we love you today. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We invite those of you in the prayer chapel and in the multipurpose room as well. Thank you for bowing your heads and hearts with us. Altar workers are taking their place even now. We're done in two minutes. But we want to pause right here. First to say thank you, Jesus, for identifying with us. Oh, God, thank you that you didn't just leave us to fend for ourselves, but love came down and rescued me. Thank you for rescuing me, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that for the many, many Christians that are listening to my voice right now, that, that somehow today you would renew and refresh our understanding and our appreciation of what it means to have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God himself in the flesh, to come and identify with us and with our sin. Such love. Such love. But Lord, there may be one here within the hearing of my voice today who has not yet chosen to identify with you. And so right now I want to give an opportunity for that man, that woman, that young person who would say to Jesus today, Jesus, I know I haven't, uh, I haven't been in touch with you much. I, I haven't really been connected to you. I haven't been following you. But Jesus, today I felt you speaking to my heart. Jesus, today I, I, I hear you knocking at my heart's door. And today I want to let you in. Jesus, today... I'm signing up with you. Today, Jesus, I'm identifying with you. Jesus, today, I want the world to know I'm with you. And so I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Make me a new man. Make me a new woman. And from this day forward, Jesus, I'm with you. If that's you this morning, I'd like to pray with you. Would you just slip a hand up high enough for me to see it and put it down? And in so doing, you're saying, Jesus, today, I'm with you. I surrender my heart to you. Thank you, sir, near the front. Thank you, ma'am, near the back. Thank you, sir, all the way in the back. I see your hand. Over the back right. Thank you, ma'am. I see your hand. I'm looking over to my left. Thank you, ma'am. I see your hand. Anyone else near the back on my left? God bless you. You can put your hand down after you've raised it. Another one over here on my right. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else today, Jesus, today, Jesus, I'm identifying with you. I'm ready to tell the world that I'm with you. Anyone else? Before I close in prayer, anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Father God, thank you. Thank you for these hands that have been raised. For the men and women who say today, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you. Jesus, I identify with you. And today I not only repent of my sins, but Jesus, I make a commitment to follow you as my personal Lord and Savior. And from this day forward, I will follow you. And as you give me the grace and the strength to obey you, I will obey you and follow you. I'll be baptized in water. I'll do whatever you ask of me, Jesus, because I have decided today to follow you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're going to close singing the same chorus. Love came down and rescued me. And again, I, I think there may be a lot of us just as Christians who'd like to just come and spend a moment just thanking Jesus that he came down and rescued you. And as you're coming, others, those of you who raised your hand, if you raised your hand to say, Jesus, today I identify with you, I want to give you an opportunity to take your first public 
act of identifying with Jesus Christ by getting out of your seat. And if you're a man walking down here and praying with a man, if you're a lady getting out of your seat and coming down here and praying with a lady, and in so doing you're saying, Jesus, today I identify with you. You come, you come as we sing. Would you stand with me? Come as we sing. Love came down, Love came down and rescued me. Rescued me. Oh, Love they're coming. Down you raised your hand. Free. Come on, you raised your By hand. They're your coming. Arms, oh, today, Jesus. I go public for you today, Jesus. I go public for you today, Jesus.